Back when I was alive, years ago, we worried about oil. So by 2013, the graphs all show that the supply of oil, petrochemicals, would go down. We know it's happened. There's more oil now than we, we keep exploring more oil. There are many substitutes for oil. You most commonly know wind power, solar power, but there are several other substitutes for oil. What are the substitutes for water? About six years ago, in a TED Talk, I talked about water, and I asked the question, what are the substitutes for water? And a fellow sitting right about where you are, sir, he said, beer. <laughs> now, I think he'd been consuming a little bit of beer before he came to the TED Talk. But the truth is, there are no substitutes for water. The average person can go about three days without water, and you really need a minimum of about three liters of water a day to survive. And I want you to think about that as I go through my presentation here. So what's the problem? I like to use newspaper headlines. This is a New York Times headline, two-thirds of the world faces severe water shortages, 2016. BBC headline, how water shortages are brewing wars. Very interesting, get a little bit more serious. And then a fellow by the name of Ismail Saragelden, you may know of him. He was the vice president of the World Bank, founder of the Global Water Project, PhD from Harvard. In fact, this is a really smart guy. He has 29 honorary PhDs, and he believes that the next world war will be over water. Now, I don't know if I think it's that extreme, but there is a water shortage, projected water shortage, and according to our intelligence community, by 2030, humanity's global water requirements with 40% of the supplies we won't have. Popular science, they do this once a year. If you look at the purple areas and the dark red areas, those are specific areas of the world. There are about 12 to 18, depending on who you talk to, where border crises over rivers and downflow water streams could potentially lead to warfare. I have two case studies. One is Lake Chad, Africa. Four countries border Lake Chad, Niger, Nigeria, Chad and Cameroon, 30 million population. You can see since 1963 to 2017 what has happened there. How do the 30 million people who survived on tourism, fisheries, and irrigation for cropland, how do they survive? Well, one way they survived is after Gaddafi fell in Libya, the Tuaregs, who were his personal guards, took all of his weapons, brought them south, and now the population around Lake Chad are responsible for much of the weapons trafficking in Africa to make a living. I like Africa case studies. This is Nigeria. You can look at this map that shows Sharia law areas and Christian areas. But look at the similarities between the topographical map of where the water is and where the water isn't. So we attribute to Nigeria a terrorism problem of Boko Haram, a Muslim organization, and Christians in the South as religious terrorism or a religious problem. But truthfully, it's more of a water use or land use problem. Desertification of this area is moving south six kilometers a year. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but you think about what you are in Boston. I used to live in Ipswich, and so six kilometers a year is about 14 years. Uh, I used to live in Maine. That's about 20 years, okay? So you think about desertification in a local area, and how would it be if the desertification continued? So not a religious problem, but a land use or water problem. What water shortage? Why do we have a water shortage? Well, I'm going to go very quickly through five reasons. Climate change, population increase, increase in standard of living, aquifer depletion, and waste. Is there anybody in the room that doesn't believe that we're going through climate change? You may disagree on how we're arriving at it, but there is climate change. 
and the world's heating up. And the droughts are not just in California, but they're in Korea and there are other places too around the world. And what happens when you have drought, your normal river flow, Colorado, for example, that feeds five states in the west, six states in the west with water, if the temperature goes up one or two degrees and the snow melt evaporates sooner, you lose a million gallons of water a day. So climate change and evaporation is depleting our fresh water supply. Population increase, about seven and a half billion people in the world today. By 2050, it'd be nine billion. By 2070, 13 billion. And then the population, the algorithm starts to go down for some reason. Population growth, people use more water, but also as populations become more affluent, they eat meat. So if you had a hamburger today, it took 660 gallons of water for you to produce the meat for that hamburger. So income increase, people eat more meat, use more water. There are aquifers around the world that are being depleted. The fresh water supply is being defeated. I have a case study that looks a little bit like me. That's my horse, JD, my wife's horse, Moonshine. We've just sold our ranch in California to a winery right next door because of water. Wells at 300 feet, get water at 250 feet, wineries use 10 feet a year, depleting the aquifer, do the math. So now we're farmers in Minnesota. Water shortages waste, the New York water system wastes a million gallons a day. So what to do? Save water, conserve, that's easy. How much water do you use a day? About 170 gallons average. What can we do? Before and after in California, not watering grass. What to do? Leverage science. Genomics, this is complicated because a lot of people don't like modified foods because of genomics. But there's pineapples you can grow in South America that use about a third of the water. And aquaponics. You see the system there, the fish fertilize the food, the water is purified, goes back into the fish. Problem with aquaponics, it's very productive, saves a lot of water. But you can't grow a potato here. So you're limited on what you can grow. Desalinization, 120 countries in the world desalinate water. A couple problems with water, desalinization. It's expensive, uses a lot of fuel, a lot of natural gas. So there's a trade-off there. Also, what do you do with the salt? If you pump it back into the ocean like is done, eventually, even though the ocean is 97% of the water of the world, only 3% is fresh water. Eventually, if you pump all that salt back, it's very toxic. If you've ever had a freshwater fish tank, you know if the salinization gets too high, your fish go blind first and then they die. Redistribute. Think about this. We have pipelines for oil, natural gas. Look, there's a system all over the United States. Why not water? Well, because they say it's too expensive. We don't have a water supply problem. We have a distribution problem. If you look at this chart, all the blue, that's where all the water is. The green, quite a bit of water. Move further west, except for the northwest, not so much. Why not move that water from the east to the west? Now, this is going to be very confusing. This last slide was a 2013. You're going to say, well, what about today? Well, this is today, but they changed the color scheme on me. <laughs> so really, the red and the black, that's where the water is, and the green is where the water is, OK? That's your visual test for this evening. So why not move water from east to west? In North Dakota, we're doing it. That water is going actually from west to east, 126 miles. But we can do it. We haven't done it yet because supposedly it costs too much. But I'm going to ask you a question. Is water undervalued? Other than conservation, all of the so what to do recommendations are always said they're too expensive. But you know, if there are no substitutes for water, what would you pay to stay alive? Thank you for listening to my presentation.